Okay, odds are, to be honest with you, going forward, this little segment of the overall course is probably the one that you're going to go back and be reusing these techniques more than anything else that we cover. Okay? So real world programming is kind of what I call this section. So we're taking a lot of things we've done so far and seeing how they're often implemented in, you know, when you get out there, you graduate and you're doing work in the real world, so to speak, right? Now there's a couple little housekeeping things we just need to get out of the way first. One of them is this option, set no count. I don't know why it's in the negative this way, but it is. So when you have to, I mean, I find myself scratching my head sometimes and thinking, okay, set no count on, does that mean I get the messages or is it off? <laughs> it's like a double negative thing, okay? But basically, this is a way for us to tell in our scripting whether or not we want to suppress those little messages about one record affected or 20 records affected or whatever, right? Why is this important? Well, it's not the end of the world, but it's a good practice and it's standard practice as well. Basically, for data returning, okay, any store procedure or something like that that returns data, in our code for that procedure, we should probably set no count to on because we already have the data, right? We can look, see how many rows we have and so on, right? If it's a data returning one. So there's no point basically clogging up the uh, network, okay? sending additional unnecessary messages about how many rows were affected by our select statement. Okay? It's just a small thing, but it really does help in the long run. Now, on the other hand, action procedures, right? Anything where we're doing an insert, update, or delete, okay? we know we're going to have potentially zero if for some reason we couldn't actually complete the operation. right? Maybe we have a where clause for some record that doesn't exist or there are no records that match it. That's fair enough, that's just logic, that's not an error, right? But we might have one or more records affected by any one of our action queries. So we should set in any procedures we write to carry out these actions, set no count to off. Because we want to allow those messages to be communicated to the client, because that's often the easiest and most efficient way for the client application to find out, did it work, right? Kind of something important you want to know. As a you know, you go to update a record, did I actually update the record or not? Okay, so that's just a little thing, but by setting no count on for data returning queries and off for the uh, action ones, it allows us to communicate that information when and if it's needed and suppress it if it's just cluttering up the network traffic with unnecessary messages. As I say here, there are other ways you could communicate success of a procedure, but this is built in, it's simple, it's very fast and performant, so just let it do its job, right? And that way the client can check, oh, did we actually do any deletes or not, right? Okay, that's just one little housekeeping thing. And before we get into actually writing these sort of real world stored procedures, there's some design considerations that we should talk about, again, applying to practical programming in the real world. Right? Three in particular, a dual key system. Now I've mentioned this in passing in the past, but we've never formally talked about it that much. So we'll go into some detail on that. Concurrency control. Right? The idea here is, unlike what we've been doing so far, where you sit down, you're the only one working in your database, right? Any changes you make, you don't have to worry about anybody else because you're it. You are the entire audience for the performance, right? But that's not how programs work in the real world, right? There's multiple users in at the same time. There could be sort of collisions between people changing the same data at the same time. Well, how is that handled? Those are concurrency situations. And there's different approaches that we might need or want to implement. So we'll talk more about that. Finally, auditing. Now, I've worked on some systems like at the credit unions, banking systems, and so on. You wouldn't believe <laughs> the degree of auditing that is required there. They have to know every detail about everything that goes on in the system, you know, not just the date and time and who the client is, but who the teller is, what wicket they were at, you know, at the bank, and, you know, every detail. Plus, in many cases, you keep entire copies of the record before and after any changes are made. That all gets put into these log files of different sorts, or log tables, I should say, right? So a completely audited system has all that kind of information stored in it. Now that's at the extreme end, but even, you know, a little program for a mom and pop uh, corner store quite often has a requirement for at least basic auditing. So we'll talk about what the very minimum basic auditing usually is and how we can implement that. Dave, before we move on. Yeah. 
I don't I didn't understand. Just step back. Why do we use set no count? I don't get why you would use it. Well, you, you would sorry, like I said. <laughs> you would use set no count just because if you're working from a client talking to the database server, you know, the more network traffic going on, if oh, it's not needed, okay. okay, we just want to eliminate it. So we need those messages sent to us to know success or failure of our action queries. Yeah. But if we're getting the data anyway, well, I can look and see how many rows I have in my, in my result set. So I don't need it to separately tell me, hey, you're, you're getting five rows, right? Okay. It's a small thing, but it is standard practice to put this option into our stored procedures. This isn't, but this isn't automatic in any way? No, nope, no, nope. something up to you to do. Okay. Now, I mean, there is a default in the database, whether it's on or off. But we usually in our code, because you never know how somebody might set it or change it, right? So in our code, we'll often put, I want to set this way in my stored procedure, right? Okay. So to talk about these in a bit more detail then, dual key is not a totally new concept. Many of you have seen and worked with it before, right? The idea is, well, let me think back for a second to term one and the kind of modeling you did then. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, quite often, most of the ideas we came up for primary keys were more typically to enforce the various business rules. Like, for example, say a, uh, uh, an OHIP number you know, should be unique, for example. right? So if you've got a patient table of some sort and all these uh, records being entered into it, okay, the OHIP number is a good candidate for a primary key because it's guaranteed to be unique, et cetera, et cetera. Right? So, you know, we often have these rules, business rules we implement at the same time that we make a primary key, and that's okay starting out. But for performance reasons alone, right, if nothing else, what works best in terms of primary keys and all the relationships that we create and, and maintain referential integrity on, numbers are a lot faster. A simple integer is the best, right? So that's why we often will have a dual key system. Our primary key. Okay, it might likely be like an integer identity, as we've done many times so far, or it could also be a GUID. Okay, no, I didn't swear. A GUID. Does anybody know what a GUID is? Globally unique identifier. With the industry standard uh, approach to this is not something just with SQL Server at all. Uh, just about any programming language these days, worth half its salt, is able to generate globally unique identifiers. The idea is that well. Actually, you've seen things that look like it if you've never actually worked directly with one. You know, those are like product keys you often put in when you're registering some software or something, those groups of six or eight sometimes letters that are, you know, there's like five or six of these groups of letters. Well, that's an example of the concept of a GUID. That's what they often look like, right? The idea is that there's so many of them, and they have certain techniques on how they're generated that help ensure that the odds of you ever creating two identical GUIDs are so small that they aren't worth worrying about, right? So that allows you, if you're using that as a automatically generated value as a primary key and table in your data center in Singapore, and you want to merge that data with the data you're generating in San Francisco and Toronto, there's almost no chance of ever getting a conflict, of getting a, a collision, so to speak, of the same value being created in, across all those different situations. That's what a global unique identifier is, right? So that's often used in the industry when you do have a distribution of your data in such a way. So that's one possibility. That's an example of a uh, database generated primary key. But you know, if an integer will do the job, which it certainly would if you're more localized, then an uh, integer is actually much faster. But the point is there's going to be some sort of a programmer's key designed to meet the needs of the programmer for efficiency or for whatever reason they have. Right? Now what about those business rules? Okay, things like I have to, you know, to satisfy the requirements of how this business works, guarantee that this particular field or combination of fields is unique. You don't want to make it the primary key and base your relationships on it because it's going to slow down the system. But at the same time, you want to enforce the business rule. So that's where the second or the business key comes into play in a dual key system. And I tell you right now, when you get hired out there, just about any large system, whether it's, as I said, as a bank, or at uh, GM or anywhere else, you're going to find they're going to have a dual key system in their database, right? So this business key, though, is actually created with what we often call secondary indexes. 
if you don't know what an index is, how many people know what an index is? I'm going to pause my recording for a second because I really think this is worth a quick discussion. Okay? Okay, so that's what indexes 